Now, next we move on to the yet uh, another thought-provoking plenary. It's important to recognize the technology lies at the heart of impact investing ecosystem. They not only generate sustainable financial returns for the investors, but also foster innovative solution to tackle society's most pressing challenges. We bring to you the session leveraging disruptive technologies to achieve sustainable development goals. I take immense pleasure in calling the panel being represented by not only impact-focused social enterprises, but investors too, to give us a holistic story. Mr. Subramani Chandrappa is the founder of Loris Bio. They specialize in developing and manufacturing animal origin fee recombinant proteins and enzymes. Next, we have Mr. Sumesh Kirotra, private sector advisor at British High Commission, Foreign Commonwealth Development Office, FCDO. Uh, it's a UK government entity, as we all know, that is responsible for issuing apostles and other foreign affairs. If I could uh, request the panelists to keep joining us, please. Next, I invite uh, Azil Subian, uh, Chief Executive Officer at String Bio. String Bio is in the business of manufacturing law materials for animal nutrition, agriculture, human nutrition, and personal care sectors that are derived using a sustainable and traceable process. And I also invite Dr. Poonima Dore, Director Analytics Insights and Cap Impact at Tata Trust. As we all know, Tata Trust is amongst India's oldest non secretary and philanthropic organizations of the country. This session will be moderated by Rema Subramanian, co-founder and managing partner at Uncle Capital Fund. Uncle Capital is one of India's leading focus early stage fund. Over to you, Rema. Thank you, Neha. There was a time when um, you had like a thousand square feet office, which had some mainframe computers to do some one entry in an accounting software to where you can have the rest, the whole world come to you through this handheld device. The last couple of years, the last two decades, especially the whole digital transformation where billions of people across the world have computing powers in their hands has changed our lives dramatically. The, um, similarly, the genetics, bioengineering and biocomputing has again impacted lives significantly over the last couple of decades. The changes in the, the um, SDG goals in the earlier decades always used to be in terms of how could we make small changes in terms of lives of people. Whereas the fact that when all these technology advancements came in, we've seen in the last two decades that there's been the quality of life, the, the income uh, levels across the globe has changed significantly, has increased leaps and bounds. We still have a long way to go, but at the bottom of all of this, underlying all of this is the need to promote more technology, disruptive technologies. So I have here with me two, um, uh, two of our leading entrepreneurs who are scientists and who have developed solutions from India for the world, who have done extremely well. And I, there are two others who come from the capital providers for this, for this space as well. Here, we are here to discuss as to what are the opportunities that we have in India and how these could create disruptive um, uh, impact. It could create, uh, um, not just in India, but outside across the globe. I first uh, would request all of you to introduce yourself shortly, and then we'll talk. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I am Ezio. I'm from a very interesting biotech, synthetic biology company based out of Bangalore called String. At String, we do uh, an interesting kind of biomanufacturing in that we uh, bring to market a lot of next generation products, alternative proteins, crop inputs. But what is interesting about these products is they are not only manufactured from a bio-based platform by leveraging biotechnology tools, they are also manufactured by using 
greenhouse gases in that methane as our primary raw material. So these products that we are bringing to market are uh, carbon negative, carbon friendly solutions, and we're also enabling carbon offset manufacturing through our process. Uh, so very, very uh, excited to be here and I've been really enjoying the discussions about how to measure impact, right? Because for somebody like us, uh, there's impact both on the manufacturing side where we convert greenhouse gases into these products. There's also impact at point of use because today we're bringing to market performance differentiated products that have um, significantly lower water footprint, land footprint, carbon footprint. So how do you actually measure impact at the point of use as well? So thanks for having us here today. Thank you everyone and uh, IIC for having us over here. We don't usually get to come to a financial kind of conference. So I'm very happy to be here. Uh, my name is Subhu. I'm not a scientist. I'm a textile engineer. And um, I wouldn't get the job in my company if I applied to now. Anyway, I started this company uh, 20 years ago and um, it's a long time. So biotech has this flat line for a long time and then you tend to be visible. In that view course, I lost all my hair, so you can guess. So when I started my company uh, 20 years ago, we wanted to conserve food, energy and water. And we used biotech as a means to do that. Uh, frankly speaking, nobody spoke about impact back then. We were a little too early. We had a lot of patents. We made sugar white without sulfur. We cleaned up wastewater. But it was a little early, not just for India, but also for the West. Uh, so over time, we moved from being a food, energy, and water conservation company to make medicines safer. So we started using recombinant technologies now. I'm sure many of you are very well versed with biotech now. You all know DNA. You all know virus you know so it's a lot easier now talking to people about what we do so we basically consider anything natural to be uh, having the same code like in software you have zeros and ones uh, in biotech you have four different variables like a ladder so you have two strands of four variables so there's just too many combinations so every living plant animal insect bird has the same code so what both Ellen's company my company or any novel synthetic bio company is doing is being able to tap into this much like you know you meddle with a cassette player you kind of snip and attach different songs to the same tape and we are able to make different products so you'll be surprised to know that way back insulins that we used in humans came from pigs so they would squeeze out pigs pancreas and we would get them and that's kind of gross right so in 70s 60s and 70s people kind of figured out the human genome watson and crick they got the nobel prize so we know what our genes look like now and what's the sequence so we were able to identify what gene produces insulin and then we took that part of the code and put it into an yeast and then when the yeast grows it never made beer anymore it made insulin so the insulin that you guys get are something like this which we reprogram into bacteria yeast and other living things so what we do now as a company, now in fact, uh, since 2011, we've been making medicines safer. So we made billions of insulin doses safer because they were using one product which came from pigs in China. They don't do that anymore. We started making human albumin, which comes from humans uh, to make cell culture and vaccines safer. So we have not yet figured out how to measure the impact because its impact is in health and insurance and many other things. And right now, uh, what you may not be aware of fully, but I'm sure some of you are, is the future of food and materials is going to come from biotechnology. Like what LL is doing is using methane from methane as a carbon source. So what we do now at Loris Bio, Rich Core became Loris Bio in the interim, and we are talking about producing egg white without chicken and eggs or casein without cows or gelatin without bones and uh, spider silk or silk without spiders or silkworms. And this is what we've been doing in the last three, four years. And we continue to do that. And now uh, personally, I'm planning to start a company to make animal fats without animals. So 
So you're going to get some fun from me and I live in the next session. Hi, that was such an educative introduction from both of them, especially for me who comes from a very different uh, domain. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Dr. Purnima Dore, but in this continuum, this doctor is not a medical one. Uh, I'm an economist, uh, I'm what I would call a practicing economist. I've been working in industry for the last several years as part of the Tata Administrative Services. So been working across sectors and uh, uh, with reference to capital and finance here, I think uh, driving finance, innovation, data and digital tools for better impact is what I think has been my focus through my work journey. Uh, I used to be with Tata Capital earlier, looking at one end of the spectrum of investing into convertible bonds, debentures, small to mid cap companies. And uh, now for the last few years, I've been with the Tata Trust, where um, I run a function called Analytics, Insights and Impact. It's uh, where we are trying to look at our end-to-end -end investments, which we do across the country on, uh, and how do we measure, how do we build uh, better ways to you know, choose what we invest in and uh, make sure that they are having the impact that it needs. Um, I do have a lot of interest in uh, questions of access access to finance, access to jobs, and uh, I do like to research and write about issues around economic structure and what we can do to unlock uh, some of the uh, gaps and the opportunities that are there. So very much looking forward to this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Rema. Uh, so first of all, uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be on a panel which talks about technology and it talks about contributing to the environment and that's exactly what we do uh, at the British High Commission which is part of the government of UK. Uh, my name is Sumesh uh, Girhotra, I'm an investment advisor with the government of UK for the last few years. Uh, so we uh, directly as part of the government and through our uh, uh, BFI, British International Investments, who I'm sure you would have heard, uh, you know, in the last, uh, it, uh, between, today, uh, between today and yesterday, uh, from some of my colleagues in BII. So, <coughs> so overall, as part of the BII, we are looking at making investments into sectors which contribute to the environment, which leverage technologies for delivering impact, helping India achieve SDG goals, uh, and uh, uh, you know, leveraging new and emerging technologies to de deliver India's targets. Uh, as part of uh, green commitments. Overall, we have a portfolio of about uh, two and a half billion dollars uh, across sectors, which I just mentioned. Primarily, we work in partnership with government of India, government of India agencies like SIDBI, like SBI, NIF are examples of uh, some of our existing partnerships. We are very, very keen to, uh, you know, leverage on existing innovations like some of my colleagues who mentioned uh, here and help attract more capital from not just domestic institutions, but also international ones to come and help India scale up these businesses and sectors. Thank you. Thanks everyone for this introduction. Let's straight away ask, um, you know, jump into the technology bit. And Subo, you mentioned about the fact that uh, getting into animal fats without animals being killed, right? Yeah. Uh, you have been looking at the entire spectrum of uh, biotech from both health, largely from a health perspective. Right? What have you seen in terms, uh, can you perhaps share with us in terms of how you have seen the technology bit to making significant impact in terms of, you know, what used to take maybe much longer time or a quicker way in which it get down to the population. Maybe can you share some bits of how you have seen the whole space develop over the last couple of decades? So uh, firstly, uh, like I said, in 60s and 70s, they decoded the human genome. It would take several years and several million dollars to decode a gene of an organism. Now we can do it at about $100, $150 and in few days. So you can imagine the compression of time and cost over the last 30 years. But from an impact on, let's say, you know, the larger population, let's take, you know, I know COVID has been a great example, but other than COVID as well, do you have examples of how it has 
changed lives for billions of people across the globe due yeah. to these advancements. Yeah. You guys already know that we were able to make a vaccine in less Absolutely. than a year. Absolutely. So yeah. that's one classic example. And now we are seeing this in, uh, you know, cleaning up waste. We are seeing this in producing alternative materials. We are seeing uh, billions of trees being saved because people are willing now to not cut trees, but produce the products which came from trees using biotech. I would argue that while the tech enablements has been improving efficiency in delivery access, etc., I think this century will belong to biotech because it's going to create disruptive alternative routes to get the same materials or better materials than we need. Can you give some examples so that you know, the audience would be... One is uh, you don't need, for example, I would give in areas of uh, food, for example, like proteins, for example. Uh, you don't need to grow the whole cow for several years to get milk anymore, right? So you'll be able to produce milk in a small footprint as big as this uh, to feed a city. Uh, like you are able to see that with biopolymers, like for example, polymers which go into diapers or bioplastics uh, are going to be produced in much larger scale now. But the technology has evolved so much that you can make it at a viable cost. And I think that's the bigger uh, impact that biotech is going to have, healthcare, food and biomaterials for construction, for uh, marine life, you name it. So as well, from your perspective, you know, you lived a large part of your life and overseas, and then you came into India to start this company. How do you see the Indian technology space, especially in the biotech, whether it's for health or whether it's for climate? How are, what is your uh, view on how this area is developing in India? Sure. Um, I want to add one more example to Subhu's before I jump into the sure. question. Is um, Lately, I've been taking a lot of Vistara flights. And Vistara is, turns out to be one of the airlines which now gives you food, like the good old jet, right? And um, on three of my flights, the flight attendant says, uh, I'm sorry, we've run out of non-vegetarian. Can you have vegetarian? What is happening is um, we as Indians, as the standard of living goes up, meat consumption goes up, right? It's one of the earliest indicators of standard of living going up, which is required because India is a protein deficient country. Uh, people think they get their protein from sambar and other pulses, but you don't, right? There's very little protein in that. I didn't hear that part. <laughs> <laughs> so it turns out that uh, an average American today consumes about 140 kgs per year of meat. Indian today consumes about 20 kgs per capita per annum. But as standard of living gets better, we are all getting towards what the Western nations are consuming. And uh, given the resources we have today, we will not be able to support that kind of consumption. So what Subhu was referring to in terms of alternative protein is going to be a very key value addition coming from biomanufacturing. And that is what we are looking at. Now coming to India, um, you know, so as I mentioned, we are, a, we are enabling a number of bio products from methane. And uh, we have two close competitors. One is a US-based company and the other is a European company. Uh, the US-based company is today scaling up their biomanufacturing in China. And uh, incidentally, the European company is scaling up their biomanufacturing in Russia. Um, so for us, we are making a strong case to the Indian government that India has a very, very big role to play in the emerging advanced biomanufacturing space, right? India already is very good at biomanufacturing. We do that in the pharma sector. Um, you know, I'm sure you guys have heard, we are the world's largest pharmacy today, right? And uh, as Subhu mentioned, the next couple of decades, you're gonna see a lot more products come via bio, right? Products that go into clothing, that go into material, that go into food, that go into healthcare. And all of this needs to be scaled up. And uh, I think India has a tremendous opportunity in terms of technology there. 
Are we there yet today? Unfortunately, that's a big no. We lack significantly in terms of capability, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of skilled resource availability in India. But if we can capitalize on this opportunity today and invest in the right sectors, in the right places, I think we have a big opportunity here. One thing I do want to mention is um, the US government just yesterday put out um, a big um, government order to bring home biomanufacturing back to the US. So the government is investing in a big way to enable biomanufacturing in the US because they feel like they've skipped the boat these last few decades. And I think you're going to see a lot more of that happen globally. And I think we um, in India should take a significant initiative there. I'm going to come back to you on the resources that have been acquired. Before that, I would like to ask Purnima is that uh, you must be coming across many such projects which talk about, uh, um, from an impact perspective, as you guys are evaluating projects, as you're, as you're evaluating um, uh, models for improving or for, for uh, you know, the SDG impact, how do you all view technology? And uh, the second part of the question, which I would like to ask you, is the fact that how do you all evaluate early stage technologies, which may have an impact in future. So, you know, how do you look at it? So, from an impact perspective and from a scaling perspective, how do you take a view and then start supporting these companies earlier? Sure. So, um, you know, one of the things uh, which uh, we're talking about disruptive technologies here and we're talking about SDGs. And a lot of uh, the narrative, I think, increasingly is to somehow map the work that people are doing with some SDG. All right. And what also happens in that is that, okay, if it is about nutrition, that is SDG 2. And then, okay, maybe somehow we'll, you know, map it to 2.2. And so when you're looking at it from the other side, often it feels um, slightly under-researched and over uh, uh, effort to map two things which may not be directly mapped with each other sometimes, but you think that, okay, this will get us access to capital or this is what the board needs or, you know, everybody is creating this uh, uh, momentum that we have to somehow link it with the SDGs. And I would pause a little to, uh, you know, uh, question that in the sense that not all parameters of impact may be measured in the, or reflected in the SDG framework as it is today. And so it is okay if there is a significant change being, you know, thought of, but if it is not directly mapping with that particular metric, it, there are ways in which you can represent it and possibly people who are funding it are seeing the value in it and will still go with you. So one is be true to what is it that, you know, you're trying to say. Secondly, um, there is also now, I think a lot of, uh, uh, from, Anyone wanting to put capital behind it, there is this expectation of rigor, of, you know, measurement. And I think the previous uh, uh, panel was largely talking about some of that. And I see this coming up when we're, you know, evaluating specific investments and technologies from two ways. One is, does this technology actually help to move the needle on some of those core SDG parameters and have the founders and has the team there thought through this continuum well enough? you know, when you are saying that this is what I'm solving for. Two is now technology in itself can be an answer to some of those questions of measurement. So I think Subo, you mentioned compression of cost and time. Now this question which came up in the last round, which was, you know, for investors, are you having to put in more money towards measuring impact? The answer is part yes, part no, but we would also like to invest in technologies which actually crunch the time to collect the data, to measure it, because that's then an investment into the entire sector. And some of that we've tried where, you know, we've developed certain tools which collect data quickly, which give a regional profile better, you know, which look at, you know, something like, so we developed it into something called Delta, which is data evaluation, learning technology and analysis. And that's because it came up from our own investment needs 
to understand the region, to do the fitment, to come up with, you know, what really works. So there is a case for good disruptive technology, which can even crack some of the data and impact parameters. I see a few players playing there, but I see a huge opportunity there as well. And so making sure SDGs are better measured, are more intuitive, are easier is, is definitely one uh, area where a lot of work can happen. I'd also like to share that for countries like India and other developing countries, there is so much of regional variation that having disruptive technology that can capture that and that can solve for that is also very important. So if we are saying that, and I'm currently writing on the regions and researching around it, there is so much, so language is one, I think many people are working towards language-based solutions which can you know solve locally, but using technology and factoring the regional variation while looking at not just product design, but also deployment techniques I think are important things that investors also need to look at and definitely those designing it, the ones that do it, I think they stand out. So, yeah. And from an early stage when some of these may not be visible also, how did you take a view on these? Uh, yeah, Rema, I think it's a very interesting question, uh, especially at an early stage when what you have in front of you is just a design, a concept or an idea and then mapping it to a scale where you can see some, some of your objectives and some of your requirements getting checked is, I think, very critical. And the way we, <clears throat> so we, of, we don't have probably the, the, the whole and the correct answer, but from our side at our funds, what we do at, uh, in the initial stage is to look at the business model very closely, understand the investment thesis and understand the psyche of the entrepreneur. Eventually, what is the objective that he or she has is building the business for. So I think that's clearly one criteria which we, you know, do a lot of uh, deep thinking on. The second and the most important thing which all of you also touched upon is ability to scale. Given the scale and size of India, uh, does this business or does that idea has the potential to, uh, you know, create and, and build a big, big market, disrupt the sector to help us uh, deliver on, on our own impact metrics and uh, uh, the targeted goals. So that's very, very important. Just to give you an example uh, of the third criteria which, which colleagues spoke about in terms of disruption. Uh, so uh, I mentioned in my introduction, one of the clear uh, objectives for us in India is to help India achieve its net zero targets. And some estimates from government of India agencies mention, you know, there are numbers in trillions, but you know, one of the estimated figures talk about a trillion and a half uh, dollar requirement for India to help achieve its own SDGs at current prices. That calls for an investment of about 28 to 30 billion dollars on an annual basis. Now clearly with diverse sectors such as uh, transport, agri, energy, this is definitely not going to be achieved on a linear basis. You need some disruption, you need a technology we can help build a sector which can help create new markets. This is definitely not going to help if it, if it goes in a linear fashion. So that's very important for us, the ability for a technology or a business to create that disruption. Something, something that radio caps did to mobility. Can that technology or that business has that potential to become a radio cab in its own sector? So yeah, that's, thank you. So it's good to hear from the, from the investor side that you are looking, willing to look at technologies um, for, uh, even though you're impact investors, that you're willing to support disruptive technologies. But, you know, Bayrak has supported some 3,500 plus companies at an early stage. And similarly, you know, there are a lot more of these clients technologies that are getting developed across the country. But if you look at the number of companies that have scaled, and even if you look at tech, a series A or kind of thing, you would still come down to maybe single digits or low double digits kind of thing. So it's obviously there's a big gap where um, there is a lot of potential that we are seeing. There's a lot of groundwork happening, but the scale is somewhere still 
uh, not there as such. Right? So from, a, uh, um, from your standpoint as entrepreneurs, what do you see as a gap for the fact that you know you have thousands of these companies that are getting formed, but from a scale perspective, we just have a handful of them, you know, like a Loris Bio or Biocon or a couple of other companies that are there, but it's still very small, right? And what is it that we can do in order to uh, to, to create these global companies from here? It's a tough question. <laughs> Um, one with an obvious answer, but I don't know how to get us past that bottleneck that we are at today. So I'll talk about what's been our experience. Um, so String, we are uh, in our ninth year now. Uh, we actually started this work in Silicon Valley and then decided to move operations to Bangalore in about 2014, set up operations here. And the approach that we took was that we would um, fund the company through our own uh, founders funds uh, till we get it to a point where, uh, you know, the products were within sight of the market. And at that time, you know, in the initial journey, I had a lot of folks say, you know, why, why build something like this in India? Why not build it in Silicon Valley and take it to India? And, you know, our uh, approach always was that, um, this is where the problems are, right? By 2030, 65% of the middle class will be in Asia. If you talk about climate, if you talk about food, any of these areas, the problems are huge here. So we said, let's build solutions close to points where it's applied and then take it out globally. Um, and we made fantastic progress from the technology side. You know, we built a, what is called a very innovative gas fermentation platform. We built our patents. We built products, we established product market fit. Uh, but the one challenge was capital. Because we got stuck in this interesting, um, I would say, gap where we were a technology-based company coming out of India. And um, the investors, I'm sure there are exceptions, right? But I would say the majority of the investors were not ready to, we didn't fit their filter for being in this ecosystem. So raising the capital always took a very long time. Uh, even if we found investors, we were only one of a handful of investors in their pipeline, um, companies in their pipeline. So they didn't want to spend time and energy to understand this because they didn't have you know, other companies like us in the pipeline. So every capital raise for us took almost a year. And uh, it was always that, you know, the first race that we did, Ankur came in and you guys valued us. The second race that we did, which is a 40 million race, uh, we had to find an investor from outside of India to come and value us, right? Because the Indian, we didn't fit the profile of an Indian company for an Indian investor. Sorry to say that. So although we talk about impact, we have significant impact on SDGs. We talk about technology, very disruptive technology, huge depth in patents, and huge impact for Asian market. But, uh, you know, so we are on one side, and then there's capital that says, hey, we want to invest in such technologies. But I feel like that capital prefers for us to be in a Silicon Valley ecosystem or maybe a UK ecosystem, build it there and bring it to India. When you say, I want to build this from India and take it out globally, you don't have too many takers. So that's been our experience. And uh, obviously, we've gotten past it and we are, we're making cracks in the wall, right? But it takes a long time to make those cracks and build the business up this way. So, Subo, before you yeah, take some question, a, I'm going to take... This sorry, is okay, a you super answer? question I want to answer. Sure, sure, go ahead. When we started... There was no VC activity in biotech. There was no BIRAC. There was no BIPP. Uh, it was find your way through. So we went to banks. They didn't even understand the mass balance because you put five tons of material and you get 50 grams. And they would say, Aap hawala kar. because you're used to putting five tons and getting at least four tons of material in a cement factory or wherever. 
when we said we made this and we have this ultra pure trypsin for insulin and it's this many lakhs, they said export kar rahe ho, paisa la rahe ho. Frankly speaking, this was the problem. Now coming to BIPP and their 3,500 fund uh, companies, 5,000, it'll be 10,000 also. The problem with BIPP is I'm very vocal about this. I've done this to them through ABLE, through all the things. They're just spraying money. So there is no cohesive plan on how to fund a biotech business. You cannot just get them to start and then leave them in the lurch. So they can't spray and pray, right? And that's the tendency of BIP. Two, the panels that they have to evaluate funds or to give funds are not today's scientists. They are archaic. If I tell them we can make a fungal amylase, which is a simple enzyme at this price, they will say, no, it's ridiculous. I buy it at 5,000 rupees because they're used to reagent grade fungal amylase, for example. So there's no way you can actually expect BIPP investments to become large, successful companies because they just give 50 lakhs to one crore. And I have a concern there. A lot of good professionals are getting tempted by this initial startup fund and leaving their jobs and not creating impact in their jobs and then getting into trouble to a point that they get emotionally drained. Because biotech is a long play, you've got to survive. It's not like you'll go make a code and in three months you'll have an MVP. You'll, you'll need five years to make an MVP. So that's a problem. Second thing, um, even in the private investor side, everyone who looks at a biotech company is a financial guy. There's a CA or an MBA or an economist. You don't have biotech guys in your funds. They don't understand the business. And then you will hire some consultant from US or Europe or somebody to evaluate your business. And it's so vast. Biotech is so vast. I cannot even start to explain how vast. So any consultant you get will not know your specific product or what she's doing. Like what I do, I use carbon source, which is sugars from plants. She uses from methane. I wouldn't be the best person to even evaluate her business. So there's a need for Indian investing community to get real technologists on board to be able to look at disruptive biotech solutions. Else, we're going to land up, like yesterday there was a session where one of the entrepreneurs um, clearly said it's impact investing but the first question they ask is not about impact but what's your revenues and we are asked worse saying when will you produce revenues not just how much so it's a problem yeah that is a cause for concern actually yeah how about coming from the fact that you can support some of these companies at an early stage how would your organization organization look at some of these yeah so um, I think that uh, there is if one looked at this uh, continuum of capital for you know these kind of ideas which can actually create impact now there is this uh, we have the philanthropy then there is I think the blended finance, which is now, you know, kind of taking stock, which I think is a very important play. And then your seed fund, early stage, so that, and then the larger investors. Now in that continuum, and having been someone who has seen that side and this side, there is philanthropic capital can come in for certain types of businesses, but A, if philanthropy has to directly put in money into it, it needs to be structured either as a trust or as a section eight. Alternately, the route which, you know, some philanthropies and definitely as a trust we've done is you create a section eight, like say a social alpha or an India health fund, which is then the vehicle through which such ideas or investments can at least be seeded. But regulation does st not stop. Yeah, for a yeah, minute. Sure. Regulation aside, uh, and take his point of saying that, you know, this is a space where there's a lot of initial patient capital that's required for a much longer period, right? And globally, that part of it has been supported either with government or with philanthropic capital, right? So how would, would, would and the fact that some of these uh, um, technologies can create an impact. So it's, so you're, you're not just talking of, let's say, creating the next best uh, um, um, warfare defense uh, um, um, technologies, but you're, you're talking of technologies which can create a very positive impact from a 
health, climate, productivity, food perspectives, right? What, uh, you know, the, the legal structures aside, would philanthropic capital in India be willing to support some of those? And like what he said that, you know, there's a whole lot of issues around what the government does and how it would be structured, but this philanthropic capital can take a much, much more focused view on doing that. Right? To get it to a stage where perhaps you get the, the um, uh, you know, the private capital to come in. Can you? So I think, uh, to honestly answer your question, I think philanthropic capital would like to and I do see some of the senior people whose wealth it actually is would really want to. Um, so some have figured a workaround, which is then, yeah, you, you can regulatorily put in money into a section eight and then through that, and then you are not concerned about it coming back to you, right? So that is then the vehicle through which that is happening. So there are cases or examples where, you know, some of that is happening. The quantum of that I think is still today very low. It, a lot more needs to happen. Two is also that um, I think the the uh, this point which you made about technological understanding in organizations which are putting money behind this is a very important factor because if they were able to see that link directly, I think the willingness and the appetite would be that much higher. There is still in India, I see a preference for getting in some subject matter expert. Local subject matter expertise, we need to give a little more credence and value to, you know, for some of these solutions, which are actually for our community and for our people. And so there, two, three things which strike me are one, the, of course, regulatory unlocking is a longish process, but some of these vehicles which are there a more capital moving into those could be one way. Two, greater visibility of how this technology is going to help solve that bigger problem. That it is not purely a for-profit solution, but it is solving for these, you know, SDGs, which is where the numbers, metrics, all of that help. And thirdly, I think, staying power with a couple of ideas or concepts behind which money is being put. So if the board is going to change its mind from time to time or investors are going to, you know, uh, uh, review it and then feel that, no, this idea is not something which is showing immediate returns. So somewhere, I think we all talk about patient capital, but patient capital needs the aggression of getting things done along with, I would say, a certain degree of terror you know, and understanding that these things are slightly complex and what is it going to take? So some amount of these type of conversations at board levels, I think are very important. So if you're choosing, we think that this is exciting and we are planning to be behind it. Let us be behind it for at least five years or, you know, look at a five to 10 year horizon of some of these things. So if philanthropy as well as, you know, early stage investors and what, you know, you were also saying are taking more and more of that view. The second, uh, since we are talking about unlocking capital, who, who comes in at series A, series B, and will they have that staying power too? So slightly longer term views of investments into impact oriented things, I think may help create more trust and create better collaboration to make these things happen. I think we're running out of time. Maybe if you could take that and then we could take a last. Uh, sure, minutes. thank you. So a short answer, uh, maybe from, uh, from my, uh, you know, in our experience on what has worked and what has not worked for us is really, uh, uh, you know, when, uh, so when you look at a business uh, and linking it to the role that DFIs and government institutions can really play uh, in a country like India is, uh, you know, where post the angel stage and post the idea is commercialized and there are investors in between is a big value of death. And that's an area where I believe uh, DFI capital, government capital can really come and play a role for these businesses to reach a scale where they can uh, approach commercial invest investors and raise commercial capital. So I think that's an area where there is still a big lacuna and that can be filled uh, given the pipeline of ideas, new entrepreneurs, budding uh, and emerging technologies which are coming to the forefront. Uh, in terms of what has not uh, really worked for us is, uh, as some of you also pointed out, capacity and capability at the fund level to assess some of these new technologies. Some of these new technologies which are coming into the market 
and trying to find new customers, new investors are also, some of them are untested, some of them uh, you know, need capital to be tested. So at times at funds, we struggle and with hand on, on our heart, at times there's a bit of gamble and a bet that you end up uh, taking uh, before committing capital to these investments. Yeah, that's a very good point. And since we are running out of time, and uh, you know, I'd like to have a closing thing from both of you, is, um, you know, today India is one of the largest markets for renewable energy, it really puts in money there. From, from the biotech space, can you guys talk about, give a closing remark on what you think is the potential, let's say, for a stream bio, a lotus bio, of how you could be a global player and how you think that this, this is the kind of areas that investments globally should be looking at you guys. Um, so I would say, you know, the, the key word I think for us is um, climate and uh, I hate to say this, but a sense of urgency, right? Um, you know, I just flew in from Bangalore. Bangalore had the heaviest rainfall that we've seen in the last 70 years. The city was half submerged. Um, and these are not unique situations anymore, right? Floods in Pakistan. Uh, heat waves in California. So my famous quote, or the quote that I really like is, um, this generation will be the first to feel the impact of climate change, and the last generation that will have an opportunity to do something about it, right, I think, from Barack Obama. Um, so for us, you know, the technologies are there. Disruptive technologies that can really address multiple impacts, whether it's direct um, global warming, um, addressing greenhouse gas emissions, increasing your yield per acre and agricultural productivity. So the solutions are there, but now I think the handshakes between technologies um, on one side and capital and regulatory on the other side has to come together because I don't think an individual or one company is going to be able to make the scale of impact that needs to happen. I think this is going to be an interdisciplinary, uh, collaborative effort that is needed to address this. So I would say that uh, we really need a sense of urgency. Um, we can't keep you know, beating around the bush or being coy about the change that needs to happen. So I would say um, we really need to take this head on right, and say what can be done fast to scale these technologies and address some of the challenges that we have today before it's too late. So I, I hate to leave on a very bleak note, but it's reality today, right? So thank you. Yeah, we do 90% gross margin, 50% EBITDA every month. Yes, 90% gross margin, 50% EBITDA, hands down. And so, if that's not investable, I don't know what is in biotech. So I'm going to give very clearly what's going to happen and where India could really go. In fact, I expressed interest to my board to move on because Laura's Bio alone cannot build the infrastructure we need. And my next uh, phase of my life is going to focus on getting many people to build plants. Right now, for non-healthcare manufacturing, we need one. 2 million liter fermentation capacity. Just imagine 2 million liters of tanks, which could make beer or whatever, can produce non-healthcare related products. You need one every two days for next five years. And this is in a global report. And no plant of that scale exists. And we are trying to build one 2 million liter facility near Bangalore right now, entire two, entire three cities. We think India has a lot of manpower which can be polished or reskilled to move into the biotech industry. So we have enough people. Do you know that Karnataka alone produces 30,000 biotech professionals who go into IT? And in India, a few lakh people. So if we can create manufacturing plants for the world, we will be ahead of the rest of the world. One, because we are still a low cost manufacturing. We are along the equator more or less. So we have sugar, we have biomass. Uh, we have water, we have too much of it in Bangalore. Uh, I think 
the next wave for Indian biotech is to do non therapeutic manufacturing capabilities for the world. And we are in the front line now. We will not be a generics or a biosimilars. We are playing catch up. And this is today. If you are going to think of building facilities after two years, we are going to be late. So if I can shout out to the investing community, look at building non-therapeutic manufacturing plants because there are just too many products that need to be made and we are there right now. We are not behind. And I think that's the biggest problem. You know, just to say that I think this, I really liked the point you had made on compression of cost and time. And um, if uh, we have to look at some of these SDG questions, there is, it is going to take high technology to do it. And India is the place where a lot of that is uh, going to come from. So even for, and we should not just look at solving for India, but solving for South Asia and the other developing economies. And I think there's a great investment story there, but yes, there's a lot we need to unlock and have different players of capital also talk to each other and find, so like NIC is a great forum where these conversations are happening. Each one comes in with things that they can unlock. So a lot more collaboration possibly to make some of that happen. Thank you. So I think uh, in terms of closing remarks and uh, trying to address the gaps that uh, all of the panelists pointed out, I think there's a lot that needs to be done to build that uh, ecosystem, that market of players, of investors, of investees and entrepreneurs who enter, venture into these risky areas and, and you know, take those bets. Uh, in order to be able to do that, I think the previous panel spoke about mainstreaming all of that. Impact, SDGs, all of these should not be seen as different as burdens, as, uh, as you know, checklists or frameworks to be complied to. Uh, overall speaking, mainly for SDGs and impact, I think all these needs to be inherently built into the business models. There need not be additional capacity or manpower put in place to help investors comply with their, their objectives and targets. So I think that there's a lot of education in terms of both uh, investors and the community as a whole to see the potential uh, of some of these sectors and come and join hands to, to, you know, to be able to bridge those gaps. Uh, sorry. Uh, my question to uh, both uh, Subhu and uh, uh, the string uh, people. Uh, the, the, you said methane, right? We we make most of uh, uh, petrochemicals out of methane, uh, ethylene, and and its varied sort of. Uh, so when you say making stuff or material out of methane, is it from some uh, bio anaerobically digested methane that gets generated from waste or some such thing? And my second question was to Subhu, I mean, just a follow-up question. We seem to have a lot of biotech parks across India, you know, Hyderabad, Chennai, or maybe Vizag, wherever. Are they not doing stuff that you, uh, you know, that in addition to Birak uh, uh, on all these uh, cutting edge technologies, or are they just focusing on pharma or some such, uh, some such uh, things? So yeah, the methane uh, for a pro process can come from either natural gas, which is from the petrochemical industry, or it can come from biogas, which is from the waste management sector. Uh, why do we work with petrochemical natural gas? Is today, uh, the oil and gas sector is one of the largest contributors to GHG emission. A lot of uh, leaks from the sector as well as flaring happens. Um, and their interest, obviously, they've all committed to net zero targets, at least the big players. And their interest in working with a company like String is we allow them to now convert that natural gas into other value-added products. And we can also allow them to diversify the products that they bring to market. But a very, very interesting use case for us is to use biogas because there it's a completely circular economy solution for us. So... Uh... Firstly, yes, there are several 
biotech incubation centers like IISC, CCAM, Hyderabad, IKP, Knowledge Park, etc. Firstly, the Indian landscape has a lot of big companies, right? There's a Biocon, there's a Dr. Reddy's, there's Loris Labs itself. And there are like trees. We are not developing the woods there. So most of these incubation centers, two, three buildings are owned by these big players. And they are focused on doing some therapeutic work. Then I've been, I'm on a biotech group which interacts and talks about what they're doing. They're somehow finding this novel food, novel protein, biomaterials, very low tech. So you're not seeing too many startups going with a more realistic, immediate business on hand. They're trying to have some kind of intellectual situation where now, by the cases we are making, we are finding some of the people who are trying to move out and say, okay, in US, cancer biologists are making cultured meat, okay, which we can eat. Uh, you're having uh, oncology, uh, like antibody manufacturers making yeast-derived proteins. That hasn't yet happened in India. The, the real scientific community is somehow looking at more producing antibodies or onco drugs, etc. I think this wave will come now and we need more bio-enabled food parks, right? Or bio-enabled biomaterial parks rather than being therapeutic uh, kind of centers. Thanks, thanks. Great. So I hope the audience would, uh, would have some takeaways from the fact that India is sitting on the, the huge opportunity of building technologies, of building companies which are based on IP-based technologies and which have a huge potential not only to create an impact, but also create, uh, generate financial returns as well. Thank you so much. I think we have overrun the time. Thank Thanks you. Thank you audience. very much, panelists.